Hello students, welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Professor P. N. Kothru from the University of Jammu. Today we are going to discuss about a module entitled Etching and Resolution of Crystals and its application to observation of defects under the paper Crystallography and Crystal Growth. Understanding of etching dislocation phenomenon and its application in direct observation of dislocation is described in this module. Different ways of etching crystals for studying defects in crystals are discussed. Application of etching techniques in solving several dislocation problems is explained. Theory of etching is described. Examples of etching supporting the phenomenon as a reversal of growth and as a powerful technique of delineation of defects and their configuration in crystals are discussed. Etching as a means of detecting presence of planar defects like low angle, tilt boundaries and twin boundaries is described through illustrations of some examples of experiments performed in the laboratory. Etching and dissolution of crystals. Although extremely powerful analytical techniques are available, yet etching or dissolution phenomenon is the foremost method of making individual crystals visible in a polycrystalline material and of detecting internal imperfections in a crystalline solid. The term Dissolution, in general, means two-dimensional removal of layers from the crystal faces by suitable physical or chemical means. It has been often said that there may be strict reciprocity between growth and dissolution of crystals. Crystal dissolution in its early stages is represented by the formation of H figures. The initial dissolution of a crystal on attack by a suitable solvent generally takes place in such a way as to give an indication that it may be related to the underlying structure. The suitable solvent or chemical reagent is called an agent while the depressions produced by it are called as H bits. When crystals are placed in a suitable solvent, their faces come in contact with the latter for some suitable time, leading to formation of a number of pits on the faces. These pits are normally bounded by sloping planes along which the solvent has acted rather faster. The solution cavities thus formed are generally having a definite shape and are called as H figures. Dissolution is required to be carefully controlled in its initial stages in order that there may not be a general retreat of the faces, edges and corners with rounding off and change of shape. Uncontrolled dissolution leads to unequal solution velocities at corners, edges and faces. The shape of the edge figures depends on parameters like nature and concentration of solvent time and temperature. In most of the cases, the symmetry of the shape and structure of edge pits reflect the symmetry of the underlying structure. In other words, edge patterns produced are related to internal molecular structure. Etching is the result of variations in surface reaction or more specifically dissolution rates brought about by crystallographic orientation effect, lattice imperfections and chemical composition. Etching is a relatively simple but very powerful tool for studying the structure and composition of materials in the investigation of crystal defects such as dislocations, vacancies, grain and twin boundaries, slip lines and stacking faults. In spite of the fact that extremely powerful analytical techniques 
are now available, etching continues to be indispensable in the study of inhomogeneity, that is impurity distribution in single crystals. Here we shall be discussing etching and dissolution of crystals. Ideally, the dissolution should be the exact reverse of crystal growth. All the atoms with energies greater than the one half crystal site leave first, then all partial layers are moved by removal at kink sites and find a perfect crystal surface remains. Dissolution must then occur by two dimensional nucleation of holes in the crystal surface. Imperfections or defects play as large a role in real crystal dissolution as they do in real crystal growth. Further, the surface of any real imperfect crystal is very likely to contain many dislocation terminations and these terminations may form the nuclei of edge pits. Etching processes are generally very complex and their detailed mechanisms are still not quantitatively understood. Etching techniques are still based on qualitative or empirical basis. Development of an etched or etching procedure for a given crystalline material is still a trial and error process. Etching method involves immersing the crystal in a suitable medium like a liquid, a solution or a gaseous chemical reagent. Tiny pits develop at the sites of intersection on the surface by defects, particularly dislocations. There are different ways of etching which may be briefly described as follows. Thermal etching. In this method, the crystalline material is heated to a suitable temperature below its melting point. It is used when one does not have an etchant and the various parts of the crystal exhibit differences in sublimation rates. Small pits are produced at the dislocation sites, as for example in silver when the same is heated in an atmosphere of oxygen. Chemical etching. This method of etching involves chemical reaction between the solid and the etchant. In this case, there is spontaneous chemical reaction between the solid and the etchant. For example, calcium fluoride when dipped in concentrated sulfuric acid results into formation of edge pits on its surfaces. Solution etching. Generally, no distinction is made between solution etching and chemical etching. Etching by solvents involves no chemical reactions. Liquid etchants are most commonly employed. However, gaseous media are also used. Example of solution etching is that of sodium chloride, which when dipped in for one second in anhydrous methyl alcohol gets etched and produces symmetrical edge pits on its surface. Lithium fluoride is etched by dipping it in aqueous solution of ferric fluoride. Preferential oxidation. This is also considered as an etching method. As for example, copper gets oxidized preferentially at dislocation sites. Electrolytic etching. This is also a means of etching and is known also as anoidic dissolution. This method has been used by Jacquet in 1954 on specimens of alpha brass. Next is cathodic sputtering or ion bombardment. In this method, the surface atoms of a given specimen are removed by gas ion bombardment. Cathodic sputtering in an atmosphere of mercury vapor has been used for revealing emergence points of dislocations in Germany. Widman Sataten was the first 
who conducted etching experiment in the year 1808 by producing characteristic ash patterns on meteorites due to corrosion with acids. Wollstone was the first to carry out studies on etching in a scientific manner in the year 1816. In the same year, Dariel tried to correlate the nature of etch figures with the molecular structure of the crystalline solids. In the latter half of the 19th century, there was an increasing interest in the phenomenon of etching. Tashar Mark in 1882, Baumhar in 1889 and Wolf in 1898 and several others contributed significantly in understanding theory and application of etch methods. In the first two decades of the 20th century, application in the methods of etching for deriving information in the fields of crystallography, mineralogy and in material science received lot of attention. Important contributions were made by Goldschmidt, Wright, Collar, Gobert, McLaren and many others who carried out goniometric examination of H figures. Myers in 1904 used a special goniometer to study ash pits while they were developed in the solution. Utilization of x-rays for analyzing crystal structures generated further interest in the methods of etching. Uncertainties about the molecular arrangement of a crystal and its symmetry could sometimes be satisfactorily explained and decided upon by the nature of edge bits. Goldschmidt in 1904 was the first to offer explanation regarding process of etching. He explained the formation of edge bits and edge lux as a result of the movements developed in the solvent. According to him, the following suggestions should hold true for the etching process. Number one, the location of edge pits are at places where the current starts in the corrosion. Preferential etching takes place along the scratches. Number three, minute particles of dust on the substance become points of first attack by the corrosion. Bunching of the edge pits takes place on the strained parts of the crystal. The presence of inclusion or impurity is likely to result into a starting point for etching. According to McNarai, 1960, the lines of selective pitting are also the lines of weak cohesion. It was followed by Desch, who in 1934 carried out etching experiments on alum. The main drawback of the theory put forth on the basis of experiments performed by these investigators was its failure to explain satisfactorily the distribution of the edge features over the surface. In 1927, Honus gave an admirable account of etching work. According to him, it is the more mature edge figures which most reliably indicate the crystal phase symmetry. The importance of etching technique in furthering the knowledge of crystallography is indicated by the extensive and ever-growing literature on the application of etching techniques in deriving information regarding various aspects of crystal symmetry, defect studies and the history of growth of the crystal. Dislocation edge pits. The initiation of edge pit has been treated as a nucleation process analogous to crystal growth. Quantitative treatments have been developed relating the free energy change associated with edgepit formation to the energetics of the surface and the bulk. So far as dislocation edgepit formation is concerned, 
these expressions include the energetic that is strain and or core energy of dislocations that is the free energy change for nucleation is reduced by the strain or core energy of the dislocation released during dissolution. Formation of dislocation H-bits. In 1951, Burton, Cabrera and Frank proposed a theory of growth and dissolution in terms of advance and retreat of monomolecular steps across the surface of the crystal. The active sites or the places along the steps where single molecular rows end. These positions called kinks or individual molecules which may be deposited or removed. When a perfect crystal phase gets exposed to a solvent, dissolution begins by the nucleation of unit pits, one molecule depth which may be called as monomolecular pit. These unit pits grow as steps retreat across the crystal through the action of the kinks. Such a process is described through schematic representation in figure 20.1 A and B. Strained regions on the surface of a well-ordered crystal will store energy. When such a surface reacts with a suitable medium, the stored energy will increase the dissolution of the strained part. Structural defects in crystals are the storehouses of energy and so are the preferential sites for the attack of the agent. It is obvious, therefore, that dislocations which are lying imperfections intersecting the real crystal surface may become preferential sites for the nucleation of unit pits and repeated nucleation at a dislocation leads to the formation of an H pit. The formation of H pits by evaporation was described by Cabrera in 1957 in terms of dislocation energy which he said has a role in the nucleation of pits. The energy of dislocation which plays an important role in the nucleation of a unit pit is called as localized energy near a dislocation line. The localized energy of a dislocation consists of the core energy and a small fraction of the total elastic strain energy. The formation of visible pits nucleated at the point of emergence of dislocation depends on the nucleation rate for unit pit at a dislocation and rate at which steps move across the surface of the crystal. The cross section of a pit depends on the ratio of VL upon VN, where VL is the lateral displacement velocity of surface steps and VN is the rate at which dissolution occurs perpendicular to the surface, that is the rate at which the pit deepens. If Vn is far less than Vl, very shallow pits would be formed which would not be visible when illuminated for lack of contrast. The condition for formation of well-defined pits is that Vl by Vn should be small. A good agent is that one which keeps the ratio Vl by Vn at the most 10. Sometimes abbreviation lateral displacement is given as Vs instead of Vl as has been taken here in figure 20.1, keeping in view that it represents the rate at which dissolution occurs in a direction parallel to the surface. Dislocation ash pits are generally pyramidal with the apex of the pyramid lying on the dislocation line. The tips of such pits follow the dislocation line as etching is prolonged. An established dislocation edge pit remains pyramidal, that is point-bottomed, 
so long as the dislocation line remains at its bottom. If for one reason or the other the dislocation line moves or shifts from its original position, the pit only increases its lateral dimensions but stops deepening. The pyramidal shape of the pits gets truncated or flat bottomed. In this case, prolonged etching would continue increasing its lateral dimensions without deepening it which eventually leads to disappearance of the edge plate. Point bottomed pit suggests continuation of a dislocation whereas flat bottomed pit suggests its origin to be as a result of some defect confined to a few atomic layers of the crystal. The situation is explained by a schematic diagram of figures 20.1 C and D. Figure 20.1 C shows schematic diagram showing formation of point bottom dislocation edge pit and D shows formation of flat bottomed edge pit at a superficial defect. Factors affecting the etching process. Dissolution is affected by a number of factors such as crystallographic orientation, crystalline perfection, purity of the solid and concentration and composition of the etchant. Some of the factors are given here as follows. Number one, crystallographic orientation. Crystallographic orientation of a surface has significant influence on its etching behavior. As a rule, the closed packed planes are more easily etched than others. Deviations from this orientation may result in non-preferential etching for some specific etchant. A proper choice of the etchant may allow etching of higher index places. Number two, impurities in crystals. In metals, some of impurity segregation is necessary before dislocations can be reliably etched. In ionic crystals, the presence of impurities does not seem to play an important role. On clean cleavage faces of such crystals, fresh dislocations that is newly introduced as well as old ones that is grown in are made observable. The characteristics of the pits may differ for fresh and for grown in dislocations. Agents that will reveal only fresh dislocations have also been developed. As already said, the visibility of H pit is controlled by the ratio VL by VN and a good agent is the one for which VL by VN is small. The quality of an agent can therefore be improved by changing either VN or VL. The usual method of decreasing VL is to add impurities to the solvent which poison the kink sites in the surface steps. Thirdly, adsorption of chemical species. Adsorption of chemical species on solids often decreases their dissolution in etching solutions and enhances the formation of dislocation edge pits. Through extensive studies on lithium fluoride, it was shown by Gilman Atom in 1958 and Gilman in 1960 that small amounts of Fe3 plus of the order of 10 raised to the power minus 6 mole fraction adsorbed on the surface at King sites decrease significantly the dissolution rate of lithium fluoride in water, while the rate of deepening of the pits remains unaffected. Consequently, the pits become deeper and their sides steeper. In fact, the formation of dislocation edge pits depends strongly on complex chemical processes which are not necessarily affected by the energies of 
dislocations. Now we shall talk about correspondence of edge pits with dislocations. Pits form during etching may not necessarily correspond to dislocations, intersections with the surface, point defects, clusters, precipitates, impurity inclusions, surface damage and foreign particles on the surface may lead to the formation of edge pits. Edge pits which are not associated with the dislocations usually do not reappear after repeated polishing and etching as their origin is due to shallow defects that is which do not penetrate deep into the body of the crystal. Ash pits due to shallow dislocation loops disappear in pairs. Ash pits associated with individual dislocations on the other hand reappear upon repeated polishing and etching. Since the dislocation lines cannot terminate within the crystal, in fact individual dislocations can be traced through the entire crystal. For our crystals which exhibit cleavage, the edge pattern should appear as mirror images on the matched cleavage surfaces. An etched thin plate of a crystal should exhibit one-to-one -one correspondence on its opposite sides. And if etching is carried out for a sufficiently long time, the dislocation pits should finally develop into individual holes through the crystal plate. Configuration of dislocation network within the body of a crystal can be traced by following the tip of the point bottomed pit on prolonged successive etching. Planar defects like small angle gain boundaries and tune boundaries can also be made observable by etching. Vogel and his co-workers demonstrated that the distance between edge pits in a tilt boundary corresponds with the experimental within the experimental error to the distance between the dislocation D as given by the Berger's model D equal to B by theta. The misorientation angle theta was determined with the refined X-ray method. In this way, they proved both the correctness of the Berger's model of tilt boundary and the reliability of etch method in revealing dislocations. Information obtainable by etching technique. Etch method is able to provide the following information in a very effective manner. Number one, dislocation etch pits provide a means of direct measure of dislocation densities in a given crystal. Number two, since the edge pits have a certain depth and follow the track of dislocation line, they can give some indication regarding the general direction of the dislocation lines. If the dislocation line intersects the crystal surface perpendicularly, a symmetrical edge pit results. If the line is oblique, that is inclined, the pits become asymmetrical and from this asymmetry, one can deduce inclination of the dislocation line. Number three, dislocation configurations in the body of a given crystal can be exposed by gradual removal of the surface layers alternated with etching. This technique can be used in mapping dislocation loops. By polishing a re-etching technique, it is possible to study spatial arrangements of isolated dislocations and grain boundaries in single crystals. If the dislocation line is perpendicular to the surface and has a helical shape, the edge pits acquire the form of a conical spiral. Helical dislocations have been shown to produce spiral edge pits. Number four. Etching techniques can be employed for studying the movement of dislocations in crystals. Number five, dislocation hop loop may lead to the formation of two coupled pits, which on continued etching approach one another and finally coalesce. A helix 
intersected along its axis is in fact equivalent to a sequence of such hop loops. Therefore, helices can easily be recognized in an edge pattern. Number six, tracks due to fashion fragments can be etched. Also, debris left by moving dislocation etches, but discontinuously. The debris may consist either of agglomerates of point defects or of dislocation dipoles broken up in small elongated loops. Number seven, dislocations parallel to and close to the surface may produce grooves along their length on etching the crystal. Here we shall discuss application of etching technique. Etching techniques have been applied to several dislocation problems. A few typical examples of the application of etching techniques may be briefly described as follows. Number one, to decide whether a given solid is a single crystal or not. Number two, to distinguish between different phases of a crystal. Number three, to reveal the growth history of a crystal. Number four, to determine the density of dislocations. Number five, to assess impurity distribution in crystalline solids. Number six, to study stress velocity relation for individual dislocations. Velocity of dislocations is found to be an extremely sensitive function of the applied stress. Number seven, to study origin of dislocations in as grown crystals. Number eight, to study deformation pattern like pileup and polygonization. Number nine, to study dislocation multiplication and its movement, for example, according to calculations of HLB and his co workers in 1951, the distribution of the dislocations in the pileups follow the relation i into pi by 2 is equal to twice pi sigma 0 x upon capital A raised to 1 by 2, where capital A is equal to g into b upon twice pi into 1 minus nu, where i is the edge pit number which is equal to zero at the locked dislocation. Sigma zero is the applied shear stress. N is the number of dislocations in the slip plane. X is the edge pit distance from the origin. A plot of the square root of the distance versus the dislocation index is expected to be a straight line. It has been shown to be true for pileups in silicon carbide and in barium fluoride crystals. To distinguish between fresh and as grown dislocations, to study plastic flow around indentations, to distinguish between positive and negative dislocations, to study kink configuration and inclination of a dislocation to delineate grain and twin boundaries, to study radiation damage in crystals. Now we come to the theory of etching. Etching and evaporation are phenomena which are reverse of growth. In crystal growth, crystal is made thicker, whereas etching means to make it thinner by successive removal of surface layers. Etch bits will be visible only if dislocation lines are attacked by the solvent in which the crystal is dissolved. According to Cabrera and Levine, in 1956, the radius of the critical two-dimensional dissolution nucleus is given by rho c equal to gamma g upon kt log of e upon c0, where gamma is the surface energy of the crystal solution interface. Omega is the molecular volume and 
epsilon theta is the equilibrium. Concentration of the crystalline substance in the solvent and epsilon is the actual concentration. If under saturation is large enough, that is if rho C is small enough, a visible H bit will result. This theory is required to be modified for etching at edge dislocations. Here, two dimensional nucleation is necessary, and we are concerned with the preferential nucleation of pits at the points of edge dislocations. This follows because the activation energy for two dimensional nucleation is locally decreased since strain energy is gained by dissolving deformed material in the immediate vicinity of the dislocations. Here we shall discuss about morphology of H-bits. Honus in 1927 performed large number of experiments and came to the conclusion that H-bits produced by different solvents on the same phase or by the same solvent at different concentrations may change form, but they invariably reveal the symmetry of the phase on which they occur. According to him, the shape of the pit is more directly connected with the intermolecular forces within the crystal which may be readily overcome by one solvent, causing dissolution in a given direction, while for another solvent this dissolution is minimum. In preferential agents, the morphology of dislocation edge pits depends on orientation, structure, and on angle at which the dislocation line intersects the surface. Apart from internal factors associated with segregation of impurities and character and configuration of dislocations, the morphology of edge pits is also sensitive to a number of external factors such as nature and concentration of the solvent, the nature of the additive salt or complexing reagent and its concentration, the temperature of etching and stirring of the etching system. Some examples of etching. As already explained, the growth of crystals is due to advance of growth layers from the nucleus center, thus growing the crystal, whereas etching is a retreat of atomic layers from the nucleation center thus thinning the crystal surface. In general, etching or dissolution is the reversal of growth. Here we shall be discussing some examples of etching as reversal of growth. One example in support of this may be cited here. Rhombohedral habit phase of quartz crystal generally has a triangular outline. One finds triangular growth hillocks on such habit faces as is shown in figure 20.2 AB. The growth hillocks are oriented as shown in the figures. When rhombohedral phase of quartz is etched by hydrothermal etching, that is etching conducted by placing the crystal in a sealed steel tube called as bomb filled with water and then placed in a furnace maintained at a higher temperature for some hours. The ash pattern produced is as shown in figure 20.3. Here also the orientation of the figures is indicated. That the growth process is reverse of etching is clearly suggested by these two figures. The situation is convincingly explained by figure 20.4, which is a schematic diagram revealing the fact that the growth hillock is due to advance of triangular layers from the nucleus center, whereas triangular edge pit is as a result of a retreat of such layers, thus producing a triangular edge pit whose orientation is just opposite to that of the growth hillock. Figure 20.3 shows edge patterns 
on a rhombohedral surface of quartz crystal due to hydrothermal etching for 8 hours. Whereas figure 20.4 is a schematic diagram showing the orientations of triangular growth figures and edge figures with respect to the triangular outline of a rhombohedral face of quartz crystal. Here we shall take up example of edge pit unfolding symmetry and revealing of dislocations. Next we come to examples of morphology of edge pits in accordance with the symmetry of the surface and the system to which the crystal belongs. Figures 20.5 A, B, C show hexagonal edge pits on the cleaved basal that is 0001 plane of strontium hexafarite chemically abbreviated as SRFE1219 due to etching the crystal in 85% H3PO4 at 120 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes. Figure 20.6 is a schematic diagram showing the structure and orientation of the edge pit. The edge patterns consists of hexagonal point bottomed as well as flat bottomed pits. The point bottomed pits are attributed to line defects that is dislocations whereas the flat bottomed pits are examples of some superficial defects which do not penetrate into the body of the crystal. In this figure there are also examples of geometrically centered hexagonal pits that is pits with regularly spaced terracing and eccentric hexagonal pits with irregularly spaced terracing. Symmetric pits are as a result of dislocations perpendicular to the surface whereas asymmetry of edge pits is due to oblique that is inclined dislocations. The above said examples are indicative of normal, inclined, stepped and bending dislocations in SRFE1219. The situation can be explained by referring to a schematic diagram of figure 20.7 A, B, C and D. The presence of impurity segregation affects the rate of nucleation of an edge pit along a linear defect. In case the impurity is such as to slow down the dissolution on account of its poor solubility, the rate of edge pit nucleation will be high only till an impurity precipitate is encountered as seen in figure 20.7b and obviously thereafter the nucleation rate will fall. During the time the nucleation rate is low, the step formed during the period of high nucleation rate will advance away from the linear defect. When the impurity precipitate gets removed as a result of either its own dissolution or by dissolution around it, the nucleation rate will increase. Let us take up examples of associating point bottomed edge pits to linear defects, so-called dislocations. As explained in previous sections, if a crystal is cleaved or fractured along a suitable crystallographic direction or plane, a pair of surfaces thus is obtained. If etched under identical conditions, is expected to produce edge patterns such as to be mirror images of one another. There has to be a one-to-one -one correspondence of point-bottomed edge pits on match cleaved or fractured surfaces in terms of number, shape and structure. Figures 20.8 AB represent edge patterns on match rhombohedral cleavages of natural quartz crystal after eight hours of hydrothermal etching. Corresponding to each point bottom triangular edge pit on one cleaved surface, there is a point bottom edge pit on the other cleaved 
mesh surface. Prolonged etching leads to continuation of the point bottom on this, these mesh surfaces, whereas the flat bottomed pits get washed off or some new ones appear at different positions. The point bottom pits are associated with dislocations, whereas the flat bottom pits are associated with some superficial defects confined to a few atomic layers only. The same is expected if matched cleave pairs are etched in dissimilar etchants as is illustrated by figures 20.9 AB and 20.10 AB. A repetition of this process will give rise to a terraced pit as explained by a schematic diagram of figure 20.7 B. In case the linear defect does not encounter an impurity and are normal to the surface of observation, a smooth centered pit is expected as explained by the schematic diagram of figure 20.7 A. However, if the linear defect meets the impurities at regular intervals, a centered and regularly terraced pit with regular spacings is expected as is seen in figure 20.7 B. In the event the linear defect meets impurities at irregular intervals on account of its non-uniform segregation, one expects pits with irregularly spaced terracing but geometrically centric as one can see in figure 20.7 D. A linear defect inclined to the surface encountering impurities at regular intervals should lead to eccentric and non-uniformly terraced pit as is shown in figure 20.7 C. Figure 20.9 A and B shows one-to-one -one correspondence of edge pits on match rhomboidal cleavages of natural quartz crystal etched by A hydrothermal method and B in NaOH. Figure 20.10 AB shows one-to-one -one correspondence on match rhomboidal cleavages of natural quartz etched by A hydrothermal method and B in HF. The etch patterns on figure 20.9 A is hydrothermally etched rhombohedral surface of a natural quartz crystal and 20.9 B is its corresponding match surface etched in sodium hydroxide at an elevated temperature. Figure 20.10 A shows a rhombohedral surface etched by hydrothermal method where a smash cleaved surface is etched in hydrofluoric acid and is shown in figure 20.10 B. The correspondence of etch pattern on the match cleaved faces etched in the same etchant or dissimilar etchants is a reliability test of etching linear defects which penetrate into the body of the crystal. One has, however, to note that to every edge pit a dislocation may be associated, but to every dislocation an edge pit may not be associated. Etching is a very simple technique with the help of which one can estimate the density of dislocations by counting edge pits spread over a particular area of surface of the crystal. Now revelation of planar defects. 1. Delineation of tilt boundaries. That is how tilt boundaries can be got revealed by etching. It was through etching of germanium crystal that Vogel and his co-workers could provide a proof in support of Berger's dislocation model of low angle grain boundaries. The angle of tilt given by measurement of distance D between consecutive edge pits in a row of equidistant edge pits on application of the formula theta equal to tan inverse B by D where B is the Berger's vector matched with the value of theta 
as measured by X-ray technique. One example of a row of equidistant edge pits along a tilt boundary, as revealed by etching a rhombohedral phase of quartz crystal on hydrothermal etching, is shown in Figure 20.11. A grid of parallel edge dislocations along a tilt boundary is revealed by the edge method. Figure 20.11 shows low angle tilt boundary as is revealed by etching rhombohedral phase of a natural quartz crystal by hydrothermal method. Shows figure 20.12. It shows series of edge bits along a tuned boundary and exactly oppositely oriented edge bits on the two sides of the boundary on a prism phase of natural quartz crystal as revealed by etching in potassium hydroxide. Now, detection of twin boundaries. When a single crystal is etched in a suitable solvent, it produces etch patterns which consist of strictly and crystallographically oriented etch bits. However, it is not so for twin crystals. Figure 20.12 shows a prism that is 101 bar 0 phase of a quartz crystal etched in potassium hydroxide at an elevated temperature. One finds series of edge bits along a boundary which separates two regions. In each region, the edge bits are crystallographically and strictly oriented, but the edge bits of one region are oppositely oriented with respect to the edge bits of the other region. The row of edge bits is formed along a twin boundary which separates the two regions oriented at 180 degree with respect to each other. It provides an example of how etching can reveal twinning in crystals. Let us now summarize what we have discussed so far. Etching and dissolution of crystals as phenomena concerned with obtaining information regarding symmetry and perfection of crystals are described and distinct. Various types of etching, namely thermal, chemical, solution, electrolytic etching, and also preferential oxidation and ion bombardment are explained. Theoretical understanding of formation of dislocation edge pits is given correspondence of edge pits and dislocation and crystallographic information obtainable by employing etching technique are explained. Types of dislocation problems that can be effectively dealt with by application of etching as a tool are specified. Etching as a phenomenon of reversal of growth is established by illustration of some examples. Examples of etch bits, unfolding symmetry, revelation of dislocation, and the spatial configuration in crystals and delineation of planar defects like low angle tilt boundaries and tilt boundaries in crystals are discussed. Thank you.